today I want to talk to you about the power of sharing stories. I was born on December 17, 1980. I was born in Bavinai refugee camp, Loi, Thailand. By the time I was born, my family had crossed the river, lived in Thailand for a year. We were on 400 acres, less than a square mile in radius. We got food three days out of the week. Thailand was practicing a deterrence policy, uh, a way of getting the Hmong and Laos to stay in Laos. But there was a genocide against my people on the other side of the river for having helped the Americans in the secret war in Laos. We had no option, so my family crossed and I was born. My parents say that I was a present in a year when they did not dream, dare dream of gifts. But I was born, and all I knew was hungry dogs and hungry chickens. I couldn't go to school because I could not do this or do this, a test of maturity. And so I spent my days in the arms of those who loved me. My mom and my dad, my grandma, my aunts and my uncles. And what they did opened up my world in a way that would change my life forever. They told me stories. They told me stories about creatures like the tiger, something I couldn't envision. I had no books, no, no television to play off. So I would say, is, is it like a, a chicken? And they would say, no. And I would, I would try to envision this creature that they told me about in the stories. A tiger that could walk and talk. A creature that knew how to do magic that people could do, but magic that we couldn't even envision. I learned about a world beyond the 400 acres I was born into. My father used to carry me to the tops of the trees and I'd ask him what is home. He would tell me a story of Laos, imagine a story in America. And then he would look at me and tell me that one day my little hands and my little feet would walk on the horizons he's never seen. That I was not a child of poverty and war or despair, but that I was hope being born, the captain to a more beautiful future. I believed him. When we came to America, my grandma told me stories. She told me stories of how education was the garden that I cultivated here, and one day we would reap the harvest together. Education was not so easy for me. It was incredibly hard because I was what was called a selective mute. My mom and I were in Kmart one day. My mom was looking for light bulbs, but she didn't have the one word for light bulbs. So she said to the clerk she was looking for the thing that made the world shiny. I could see the clerk doing this, and then she walked away, and she didn't come back. My mother, who was far younger than I am today, and I thought the most beautiful woman in the world, definitely the most courageous. She stood there for a long time, and then she started looking at her feet. And I decided in my heart, in the heart of a little girl, that if the world we lived in did not need to hear my mom and my dad, then surely they did not need to hear me either. Because at work, my father's supervisors were telling him things like, B, you're here to talk to the machines. You're not here to talk to us. And so I stopped talking. At first, it was a great rebellion. I go into school, and I, I say, I'm not going to talk today, and I didn't talk. But slowly, the silence grew inside of me, and the rust in my throat grew in English. So we got to a point where the teachers would say, Kao Yang, are you here? And every time I whispered here, the rust would come out in my voice, and all the other kids would start looking. Something started dying inside of me. But I was a kid, and the words had to go somewhere, and so they went on the page. They went to, to the form that I loved most, the stories. Every time I wrote something for my teachers, whenever I made a mistake, whenever I was unclear, there'd be a squiggly line and a question mark. The question mark was, what do you mean to say? They give you enough chances, and you start getting strong. You start knowing what you're doing on the page. So I write in English the way a native speaker speaks. This is the language of my heart. But English is the bridge I build from here to there each and every day. And it is the bridge that I, I, I can, in my brain, I can see, I can construct on the page, on paper. Now, I don't need a key. I, I have a key to the lock. I, I don't need to ring a doorbell for you to let me in, in English. And so I became a writer in the process. I did not know then that one day I would stand in front of people and talk about the stories that make me who I am. I didn't know that one day I would stand proudly in front of a room of child services people and say that my mom and dad worked at night and my sister and I took care of the children during the day. It was the secret that we hid in our home because we knew that if we went to school and we told our teachers, because I was 12 and my sister was 13, that we took care of children every night when our parents went to their jobs, a second and third shift, assemblers that, that we could get taken away from our parents. We knew that maybe it was illegal. I had no idea that these would be the stories that I would be telling to the world, that I would be exposing these realities that, only, that not only my family, but so many other families lived. 
but that's what I do for a living. That's what I do for a life. I tell stories. I had no idea, idea then what the stories would do for me or the world that I lived in. In 2008, I wrote a book called The Late Homecomer, a Hmong Family Memoir. I didn't expect anyone to come to the launch. It was a snowy April evening, common enough here. Uh, <laughs> I went there thinking that all I had to do was stand up, sit down. Everybody would clap, and then I could sign books and have some appetizers in the evening with cereal. But that was not the case. I walked into a room with about 300 people, about the size of this room, actually. Not just men and women, my mother and my father, my aunts and my uncles, but all of these people who had taught me all along the way. So many teachers, so many educators from the St. Paul Public Schools. And I couldn't speak. I got up and I sat down. I got up again and I sat down. And my father, he walked from the back of the room. He walked, from the, he walked in, in the Brooks Brother jacket that I bought him. The most expensive thing that I was able to buy before my father. A, a year at Columbia, I had $500 left in fellowship money. You know, because when we were kids in third grade, Doe won the North End Elementary School spelling bee. Doe, my older sister. Doe, who would become the attorney that she said she would be for our family. She won the North End Elementary School Spelling Bee two years after we came to the country. And she got $50. With her $50, she bought her father his first pair of nice shoes at Kmart. Shoes that actually fit because previous to that, he'd been getting his shoes from the church basements and they slapped the ground when he walked. So my father was always embarrassed in the hallways of the schools that we attended. And then with his rough machinist hands, hands that cut into metal, the meadow had done its wear. My father was always embarrassed to shake hands with her teachers. But Doe bought him shoes that made him walk prouder. And so I always thought in my brain, one day I'm going to buy my father something that's going to be better than $50 shoes from Target. I mean, from Kmart. And then I got $500, and the most expensive thing I could do was buy this Brooks Brother jacket. So the night of my book launch, my father wore it. He, he sat in the back of the room, but he got up and started walking toward me as I struggled to, to speak. When my father stood in front of me, he, he opened his palms. And I, uh, my hands were shaking, so I put my hands on top of his. And he said, Minai, from hardness you can give birth to softness. I have the soft hands of a writer. My father said to me, words I'll never forget. He says, if Hmong tears can reincarnate, we would rain the world with our sorrow. But because they cannot, they can only green the mountains of Pumbia. If you speak, if you tell our stories, then maybe our lives were not lost for anything. Maybe the winds of humanity will blow. That's the first time I spoke publicly, and I've been doing it ever since. I go into schools and I tell, I tell children, classrooms full of, you know, Hmong children, that whenever we point to the moon, the moon comes and it slices our ear. It's not imaginary, it's a real cut in the ear. You know, and, and then they and I say, does this happen to you guys? And they think about it for a long time and then slowly they raise their hands. It's happened to them as well. Because when I was young, I used to tell, whisper this to a few of my classmates and they tell me I was crazy. They tell me that I was lying. How could the moon slice the ear of a child? And I would never have the words to say anything. When I was a child and people would say, where are you from? I used to say Mongolia because it sounded the most like Hmong. Because I am Hmong, but not written in the history books of America. I'm Hmong from a war that's undocumented. When we studied about the Vietnam War, it was the Americans in the North Vietnamese Army. It was the Viet Cong. Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was nothing about the people like my men, my, like my mom and my dad, women like my aunts and my uncles. And so that's what I've been doing. I've been talking and I've been sharing our stories, the secrets that we've been hiding for so long, the burden that we've carried without understanding on our side. Because all over this country, people ask, where are you from? What are you doing here? I belong to a people, to a mother and a father who cannot explain what we're doing here. So that's what I do. And when my book came out, it was the first time people came up to my mom and my dad, strangers, and they said, welcome to America. They said, we're so happy to have you here. And my mom and dad, 10, 15 years, 20 years after the fact, they stand there and they, they weep. Every time I speak, if there's a Hmong man or a woman in the background, they come up to me and they say, thank you, may I? Thank you for telling our stories stories that we've li been living so long to tell. All of this started at Carleton College. The, the, I think the, the, the confidence to contribute started at Carleton College, where I was whispering everywhere. And one of my teachers took me aside 
and said I could, that it was selfish of me to absorb knowledge and not give it back, that I stood to become a producer of knowledge. He said that knowledge was just the things that made our lives possible, that it was the stories that we were living, and that my story, that the Hmong story, belongs somewhere in the spectrum of history. It is to his words that I stand before you. If an education does not give you the confidence to contribute, then it has failed you. It has not given you an opportunity to learn how to express, how to share, how to be heard for who you are and where you stand in the spectrum of humanity, then it has failed you. That's how communities are built. It is when I understand your story, when I know the history of slavery, when I've read through the trail of tears and looked at the images, and I feel it in my heart when my heart cries for you, that I belong to you and that I belong to your story. You know, so often we think that our stories are our own, that they're the thing we wrap our arms around. But my grandma, who died an old lady, far wiser than I, than I stand here before you, the woman I aspire to be, she said that life was just moments strong on the thread of time, that it is impossible for any one human being to give our all to, to, to all of life because that's so huge, but if we could give our all to one moment, then we open up the possibility for the next. She said that at the end of it all, all she had to gift us with were the strength of her stories. That was it and that was all. She lived, she said, for over 100 years. She survived two wars. She lost her husband, buried her children, raised over 150 grandchildren. But she said at the end of it all that all she had to give us was the strength and the power of her stories. My grandma, who I thought was the strongest human being alive, when I, was a, when I was a child, I, you know, the ice cream truck would come and I would uh, stand at the window waiting, hoping for a quarter from one of the adults around me. None of the adults around me had quarters to share. So I'd see, I watched the ice cream truck stop and all the kids would run up and they would, they would get ice cream. And my grandma used to watch me. And then she'd take my hand and take me to the kitchen, spread sugar on my tongue and put an ice cube. <laughs> and tell me that that was sweet and cold coming together in the mouth of a child. I was an avid dreamer. I made lots of wishes. I wished for a life where my mom and dad did not have to stand up all night with throbbing feet, come home with bleeding feet, ask us to massage away the hurt. And I used to make dreams. I used to make wishes. I used to stand out loud and say, this is what I wish for, because I thought that by articulating your wish to the world, you were changing the odds around you. And then the next day, they would go again they come back and the same thing would happen. I would see blood on the bottoms of their socks. And I, I, one day I grew despondent and sad and I stood up before my grandma and I said, what's the point of all of these wishes? What's the point of telling the world what you want when you don't know how to go into it and get it? And my grandma looked at me for a long time and an airplane flew overhead and she pointed to the plane. And she said, may I send your wishes on the planes? That means it's somewhere in the world waiting for you to find it one day. Your wish isn't dead. Your wish hasn't just, you know, it didn't just disappear. You're sending it on a plane somewhere in the world to be found. And maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe 15, maybe 20. I don't know how long it'll take, but one day you'll find it. That's what I started to do. My grandma and her stories, her magic made me stronger for the world that we lived in. When everybody got braces, and I wanted braces too because I wanted straight white teeth. I go to my mom and dad and they say, we can't afford it. And then grandma would take me aside and she'd say, Minai, is my smile not beautiful? And she smiled her single tooth. <laughs> you know, With that single tooth, we took down Jolly Ranchers, ice cubes, we gnawed on bones. It was an incredible tooth. <laughs> and I could not look at my grandmother and I could not tell her that her smile was not beautiful. And then she put her hands on my ears and she'd say, you have beautiful ears. You have perfect ears. You could be an ear model one day if nothing else worked out. And I look at her torn lobe because as a little girl, she had fled from a jungle, uh, tiger in the jungles of Laos. I look at her, her, her ear, her, the torn lobe. And I knew that my grandmother was gifting me with a story. She's giving me something that I could give to my daughters, to my, to my children one day sometime in the future. You know, I have a daughter, 18 months old, Sheng Yang. She, uh, she, she came long after my grandmother had left us. But through grandma's stories, through the stories that I write and the stories that I speak, 
Because my father says when you speak, you write on the surface of the human being. No longer writing on, on paper, I'm writing on the surface of the human being. I hope to impart to Sheng Yang the wisdom of Zhuo Li, a woman who never learned how to read or write, a woman who never went to school, but who has taught me so much about the world that we live in and the world that we belong to. She taught me how to cry for myself and cry for others because our tears and our words are our first gifts. She says, when there's nothing in the hands, you can still offer what is in the heart through your words. And that's really my relationship to language and to story. It is my way of opening my heart and giving you a glimpse of what's inside, sharing. Sharing all the things that I store inside, all of the stories that make me who I am. Because when I stand here beside you, I'm just a short pregnant woman. <laughs> you know, breathlessly, breathlessly speaking words. It is these words, though, that come from my heart, and it is these words that carry the essence of everything that I am, everything that I aspire to be. Sharing these stories have made a home for me, not only in Minnesota, but in the skin that I live in. I'm no longer shy about being Hmong in the world. I'm no longer shy that my mom and dad stood, you know, to tell, to, to tell everybody that my mom and dad stood by tall machines, using their hands to fight the engines. Of course, their hands have fallen apart. Using their ears to listen to the beeping. Of course, their ears have fallen apart. They can't hear anymore, my mom and my dad. But the stories that they tell me opened up my heart. And each and every single time that I have an opportunity to speak to people like all of you, I get to let my mom and dad's voices be heard. And that's the power of sharing stories. We don't just live in our own stories. We belong to all of these other stories and all of these other people. And no matter how long they've been gone, we can call them back from the dead. We can show the world who they were standing among everybody else. That old woman selling vegetables that you see on Saturday or Sunday. That's the voice that I'm speaking for. That's the voice that makes mine possible when I stand before you and I share our stories. Thank you for having me.